Hey, everybody. My name is Rada Blank, a uh, native New Yorker, and I'm here thrilled to host a conversation with the filmmakers of LALAC. I just want to give you a little bit of information about the film before we start the conversation. LALAC made its world premiere at the 2021 Tribeca Film Festival, where it won the special jury prize, and it has been blazing through the festival circuit. Um, it also garnered top awards at leading international film festivals, including the Galway Film Festival uh, in Ireland, the Short Shorts Film Festival, and just numerous festivals. Uh, it has just garnered so much love because it's such an amazing, poignant, and personal film. Let's welcome the filmmakers of LALAC. We've got Scott, <laughs> Mustafa, I'm sorry, I need to get your last name because I want people to hear you. Scott Aharoni. Did I say it right? Perfect. Um, who's a director and producer. Mustafa Kamak. Did I say that right? Writer and producer, as well as Dennis Latos. Did I say that right, Dennis? Perfect. <laughs> Who is also director and producer. And Coleman Domingo, executive producer of the beautiful film Lay Like. Let's give them a round of applause for creating such a wonderful work. Um, First of all, let me just ask you all, how does it feel to be on this side of your filmmaking journey where you have put this energy into this project and it's received all this love and all this accolades and you're sharing it with a, a wider audience? I'll kick it off. I mean, it's, it's such a beautiful thing to put your blood, sweat, tears, your heart and soul into something, especially during a time like this and the topic manner in which we did it. You know, we brought all our friends and family together to make this film actually possible. Um, you know, when we shot the film, it was a lot of our first films since the pandemic, since the lockdown. So we were all in a nervous place, but because we were able to bring our friends back to work, you know, back to a place where they called home. It was a very rewarding in that regard. But then to have one of these first projects being shot back in New York and now having its world premiere at Tribeca in New York and now having all this other acclaim, which has been incredible to receive, it just puts it into perspective of why we did it and who we dedicated the film to. And I think our ultimate goal was to do it do them justice to bring light to those frontline workers who may not get the, you know, the recognition that they should. And I think that's was our goal. And I think right now we're able to get it out to the world. So it's been very mm -hmm. rewarding in that regards. You know, um, there were just a couple of things that came to mind when I watched your film um, for it to be the length that it is, which I think it's 16 minutes. I found it to be just so patient. It was such a beautiful, slow burn, so to speak. Um, it was very patient. It was very confident. Um, I found myself contemplating this idea of, you know, who gets to die a dignified death, especially when you open with all of those um, graves, you know, um, being dug up by brown people, people of color. Um, I just, you know, and your cast is astounding. Can you talk about how you found the actors to play the father and daughter? Sure, I, I hop on that. Um, well, um, I met with uh, the lead actor, Nadir Sarabaja, a few years ago when he moved to the United States. He uh, was a well-known actor in Turkey. And uh, most, uh, you know, known film that he acted was uh, Winner of Palm d'Or uh, a mm -hmm. few years ago with a movie called Winter Sleep. So he was a well-known person living in America. But, you know, the challenge is when you first time come to a country, you change it, you don't speak the language. So you just wait for the right project to come to you. Mm -hmm. And this Leilak was actually written with Nadir in mind. I talked to wow. him. I said, listen, we, I received an incredible inspiration and we are literally going through an amazing moment in life. I, that I wanna create this expression with an amazing team, Scott and Dennis, the earlier stages. He liked it, he liked the uh, concept, he liked the idea, he liked to become the voice and the sto story of you know, many. So that's how it started with Nadir. 
And after I, we, you know, we agreed on Nadir and he loved the project, we started developing. And then we found amazing Isabel Lejado. She uh, never acted uh, in a film before. And she was luckily only 30 minutes away from me. Um, it, wow. It's one of the most challenging thing that I noticed when I did my previous film was the casting because you really, yeah. don't, unfortunately, you know, you cannot find the people from your culture usually when you, the, you write mm. for them. So I ended up uh, flying those two actors from Germany. But for Isabella, she was 30 minutes away from me. And I found wow. her through backstage. I saw a okay. few pictures. I said, she, she has an incredible vibe. So I just wrote to her. I said, hey, would you be interested in? And then immediately her mother responded and then they sent me audition tapes. I was like, this feels right. It was such a beautiful chemistry between the two actors that, you know, not once did I break out of the world that she created because it was so believable. Um, and again, I, I, I think of the word confident, you know, because I think when you only have 16 minutes of time to tell a story, I think that another writer might feel like I need to get as much information in there um, as possible, have the characters say things. But one of the things that impressed me the most was not once was the word COVID mentioned in your film. And yet it was such a palpable presence um, in, in the movie. So congratulations on creating something so powerful. Can you talk about the inspiration behind the film? Um, I know that the, the title comes from a poem that you wrote, Mustafa, am I right? Right, right. you're, you're okay. so right. Yeah, so title Lailac uh, refers to a flower lilac in English. Mm. And uh, it's, it's, it's a metaphor for the overall story to me. It's, um, you know, Lailac has the earliest uh, blooming time. It blooms very early and then it kind of fades down very early during the spring. And it kind of, that's the transformation that Isabella goes through in the movie, the Ren character. She's so young, naive, she wants to live an amazing life. She has dreams, but then yet she loses her mother. She has to grow up much quicker. And with this story, we kind of try to say that story. And uh, the whole story came from just the one paragraph of uh, exchange in a poem mother, uh, father in dark, that's how film started actually at the beginning, mm. father was, was whispering to his uh, daughter, saying that, do you know why your mother calls you Leila? Mm. And father responds saying that, because you're her flower. Mm. So with mm. that in mind, I was like, there is, there is an incredible story behind this. That I just have to you know, be vulnerable, go through this journey, and for a few weeks, I, you know, I was with these people and it, it was hard, very hard to go through. Even as a writer, I cannot even imagine how people can actually go through these times. It's not, you know, overcome those kind of traumas. It's difficult. You know, something about, there's, I wanted to add this, uh, Rada, there's something about bringing up the lilac that I, I told these guys before that it stays with me is the moment she, the young girl pulls her mask down to smell the lilacs. Just in that one moment, I just thought there's so much there uh, about knowing the times that we're in, knowing the devastation that's around, but also right. the knowing the innocence of like somebody who's just, who just wants to smell the flowers and live and be a young woman. But she's, but knowing that it's inevitable that the thing that she's has to cover back up with, it's all around her. So something about that you, image. You know, the me. other, the converse of that is relating smelling the flowers to mm. just facing the truth you know like mm. the fact that this father has to tell this you know that, that beautiful twist kind of dark twist uh in the plot you know where he we as an audience learn what happened to the mother and having to watch him tell the daughter this truth that it's ultimately going to cause her to grow up while you're here Coleman could you talk about how you became involved in supporting this film? The beautiful thing is that these lovely gentlemen reached out to me as they've gotten to know um, my production company, Edith, and sort of all the things that I'm sort of drawing to, to my world, hopefully. And they believe that I'd be a wonderful partner. They sent it over. 
And it, you know, you know, you get things all the time, but this mm-hmm. seemed really special. Just, just the ask was special, and just inviting me to be a part of something and amplify something that is meaningful. And I, I looked at it immediately, and then I had to watch it again to make sure I saw what I saw. Yeah. <laughs> and I, and, I, right. and I, th- I thought this is special, and I want to do everything I can to make sure it's amplified. These stories are told, especially I think maybe you know Rada, which is even why. We even engaged with you being with this panel because I think you're such a native New Yorker and New Yorker has such a story in this when it right. comes to the pandemic. And I do feel like while things have opened up and we're moving forward and things like this, it's important for us to remember all the things that are still going on. We're still in the middle of it, in the middle right. of the middle. And people right. think, oh, we moved on, I'm back on Instagram. You know, <laughs> but I think it's like, the, Ask story like, Omicron about that. But but the thing that I loved about the story and why I wanted to be a part of it was because of, because it is so now that we we need to anchor ourselves with what's going on right now while we're still trying to live to quote unquote normal lives. So um, right. I, I can't be prouder to be a part of this. Well, it 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 did, you know, it did feel urgent. It felt like it was happening right now. And, but it was also very refreshing because you don't, uh, maybe because of the current climate, whenever we focus on immigrant stories, we tend to focus on the same group of people um, Mm -hmm. or groups of people. I've not seen a story like this, especially about, you know, people from the Turkish community um, having this small but big experience, you know, which I guess, you know, people uh would say it's a universal story but it's still important that we have a specific experience for people from a certain culture so i I just think it'll it will refresh you know audiences to this new culture but also be something that we all can relate to can you all talk about what it was like to come together around this project because it's hard enough for a director to get behind a narrative piece, but how did the three of you come together around this singular vision? Yeah, so I think, you know, initially, uh, Dennis and Mustafa and I were going to be working on a project and then COVID happened and then that project wasn't going to happen anymore because of the lockdown. But it kind of, we saw a lot of friends lose their jobs and we were like, this is, this is a moment where we could go into a very dark, dark place where we can use what we do every day, which is an art form to express ourselves and to let some light out there and to give opportunities to our friends as well to all to come together. So we said, you know, maybe this is something that we can focus on to, to create a story out of and not necessarily create a timely story, but a timeless story where it's, it's about a father and a daughter. It's about grief. It's about struggle. It's about uh, coming together sh- to be stronger um, as one. And I think we all have the same exact motive in doing this. And it's to create a moment where people can relate to, they can comfort to, they can look out to the future and say there is light. And as long as we all just come together, so mm-hmm. I think it was just a beautiful collaborative process where we just wanted to create something great that people can, the whole world can relate to because all of us come from different backgrounds. Dennis is Greek, Mustafa is Turkish. I have family all around the world. And I think that's what also New York is. It's a melting pot. Different cultures are coming together where we shot in Queens in Astoria. You have every walk of life walking around and everyone's accepted. and at the end of the day, we're all just one people. So I think that's was our ultimate goal was to create that universality within our film. Now that sounds great, Scott. That sounds great. But this is New York and New it York is. is an opinionated, right? It is, it is. How did you, so just give me an example of how the three of you attacked a page. You got hmm. three different human beings three different experiences, maybe of the same thing. How did you decide, you know, what the aesthetic 
and what the point of attack would be for a scene since it's three different minds mm. coming together. I think people would I love understand. to learn. Yeah. Gotcha. Right. I'm, gotcha. I'm going to dive into that right here. So I'll, I'll break it down from my point of view. What I wanted to create was more of a documentarian type style of a film. Sure. I wanted to dive in, do long takes. I wanted to feel the characters, walk with the characters and let it feel like, are we watching something that happened in real life? Because it was, and also have a narrative approach. But, you know, where we have Mustafa's script, it was the blueprint. It was, it was what we had to work off of. It was the story. It was everything. It was the character. He had the entire character arc all laid out for us. And it was just the little moments that we were discussing all together of how to play them out. And then we had certain rules per se. We didn't want to mention the word COVID. We didn't want to see any nurses, ventilators, someone coughing. We didn't want anything necessarily to do with COVID that was in your face. And that was just certain things that I particularly wanted to do. And then, I mean, I'll let Mustafa and Dennis discuss what they wanted, but it, it, trying to balance everyone's you know level out, I think at the end of the day was we kept going back to the script and seeing what the script was succeeding at. And it was moments, it was um, artistry that we wanted to just enhance and how we had to do that from a directing point of view. But I guess I'll let Mustafa kind of explain yeah. his collaborative process. You, you, you talk beautifully. I'm just gonna add one thing that uh, it's a short film. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. We are still trying to tell a bigger, big, very big story, but we only have uh, you know space uh, for only uh, uh, one or two characters. So thinking, keeping that in mind, we kind of, I, I kind of want to think that we watched a, a, a person going through a rough time on the single, from a single perspective, that's his life. A father going through a very, very hard time to accept the truth. So that was my overall, you know, arc of, uh, and then there's a twist at the end and we see what happens. But that was pretty much the one sentence that I can tell about it. Yeah, yeah and if I, if I could chime in too, um... I just think it all starts right with the script and we spent a lot of, I mean, Mustafa spent a lot of time, but we had a lot of meetings in person talking about the script, going over it, giving our notes. Scott gave his notes. Then if Scott gave notes, um, I, I would question his notes, but you know, from a challenging perspective, he would question my notes, so on and so forth. And we would just have constant discussions. And I guess we mm -hmm. were just, you know, pulling it apart and putting it together, pulling it apart, putting, you know, what's working, what's not working. And I think, since we spent so much time on the on the script and in in meetings and creative meetings, I think we really made the best thing possible. But I think everyone gave their own experience, everyone gave their own input, and then we kind of just agreed on something. And when we finally had something, we were said, "Okay, this is it. Let's let's go shoot it." And then I'll just add this because there's something that you guys have told me that you would also still invite the actors to really find. What works for them? That you would, you still mm -hmm. left some room for collaboration, even though you made all these these decisions. Like the moment where um, our lead character sniffs the the um, the mask. The mask. You, yeah. you just had uh, produ production design. That, that was said, beautiful. Sir, just sir, just put things there and say, and they said, go for it. Use that's this is where your wife your wife's things, and so that choice was made on. He just made that choice as well, and they were like. Yes. So it was a yes and, I think, to it. You yeah, know, it. yeah. Yeah. And I think right. it's a winning. This is this to me is like a winning combination. Um, I think if you guys if this is the start of your filmmaking career, then I think you can only go up from here because in, in my opinion, it is the script. And you can never spend too much time working on the script. It's your map, it's your GPS for your storytelling. And also, you know, I've always wanted to be the kind of filmmaker who, you know, you hire actors, you have to hand over some trust. They're not simply there to go through the motions. They are your uh, co-director, co-filmmakers, so to speak. You know, they're embodying. And so that scene with the mask was palpable. It was so mm. powerful. And again, this is to me, especially for younger or newer filmmakers, you know, sometimes you just have to trust the elements that are in front of you. You don't have to overwrite it. You don't have to overdirect it. You have a moment like that and it says so many things without saying a word. So um, hats off to you all. Um, there's a moment in the film 
that was especially triggering for me. Mm. And it's probably not, it's not something dealing with the plot. It was just anytime I see a scene shot on a train now, I just, I start shuddering because <laughs> I know how hard it is to shoot um, <laughs> to shoot on a train in New York City. You know, I, I, you know, you know how it is. It's like once you go through the filmmaking process, you watch films differently. You're not just an audience member. You're a person who participated. And so that moment, I just I found myself looking at everything outside of the frame of the actors because because you know like anybody can walk into the frame the mta might try to shoot you down could you talk a little bit about getting that really poignant final shot in the film honestly scott um this is all scott but i was like freaking out because i was like scott we're gonna go on a train and he's like no 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 trust me i've seen it we're going getting the camera running gun right on the train are you sure are you sure we're gonna do this yep we're gonna do this okay and then we played it all out but Scott, Scott really made a push for that. Like no permits, no nothing. We weren't getting get permits that? anyway. How, Scott, how did you get that? No, no, well, we just, we just, I said, let's take a, you know, it's very small crew. We're going to just hop on the train because the trains were already kind shot. of dead. It was, yep. you know, to steal the shot. And, you know, you read the Safi brothers do it all the time with uncut gems and, and good time in New York. They're going through malls and they're not getting permits. They're just flying through. And it's just so authentic because you just, you have no, there's no like mental rehearsal time. It's like, you're going to do it and we're going to get the heck on out of there. But, okay, I want to know what train were you on? What, which one? It was uh, the D train. And yep, going it, it, over the it, bridge. Hey, yo, that's all right. Was it the D? It was from Dittmar's Astoria and we went, went straight. Oh, to it was 10. the N. Was it the N? The N train going over the bridge, train. though, right? Oh, yeah, 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 it goes yeah. up the bridge, well, over the Queen's Bridge. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> some crazy crazy stuff but basically went on we said we have you know four takes we're going to lead ourselves right into manhattan mm. and i said you know let's just let's do each time just do something different they knew the the moments they had to hit hit the hold the hand touch the shoulder but do it on your time once again trusting your actors do it when you feel you're going to do it even if you're there for five minutes even if we don't do four takes we didn't tell them how many takes you wanted to do just just let it be. And our last take, which was the last take we knew we were going to have, we just said, just take, just take as much time, take more time this, you know, and they mm -hmm. just did their moments. And once again, having unscripted elements, kissing the hand, we spoke about it all together. And we said, you know, those are the moments, you know, pulling your mask down, sniffing the flowers, kissing your hand. These are things when you have a mask on, it's much it, it, it creates tension, and those are the moments that we make us human. Just one small note also. A movie ends with the train entering the tunnel. Right. So that, that was very intentional. They're coming, I mean, stories about them entering, yes. right? They're entering mm -hmm. to the light, but it's, in fact, that's where it, once they enter into the tunnel, that was like not, uh, very authentic that we know that was the, a new journey. Facing start. that truth, having to face that truth. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, very powerful. I mean, it's a, making films in New York is insane. Any and everything <laughs> that can happen to you will happen. Um, mm -hmm. But there's nothing compares to that rush of when you get the shot. Um, but yeah, you might have to deal with a couple of un, unhoused people or, you know, this is when the Showtime dancers want to come in and, and it's showtime, you know, like when you get the take that you want. Um, but that's part of the um, the exhilaration of making film in New York. So um, I find that when you put something out into the world that people enjoy, they want more of it. They want more of that thing in particular. Like, is there a feature? Is there a series? Like, and does that annoy you the way it annoys me when people ask me that question? <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't think I don't think the, the question is not annoying it's more it's more of a compliment I like to think if people want more of what we did I think that's a great thing and it was never our intention to do a feature but I think there's a lot of elements within our short um that we can pull out as inspiration to create a much larger story between a father and a daughter and from people's connections with their story I think there's the feature um 
who knows what time will be like, you know, who knows what will happen. Maybe there will be a full feature, a complete adaptation of what we have today. Well, I'll tell you who I need. It. I need the sister in it as well, by the way. Mm. She's, oh, she, she's, this she's cast for, for the sister and the co-worker who was, was digging the graves, those people to bookend the level of investment. And this, this is what I have to say about actors. You know, clearly this, they, they abide by this idea that there's no such thing as a small role. Like I just could not imagine the wall, the world or the colors that they created if those people were not there. Because for the mom to not ever show up, she was so present, especially mm -hmm. when the sister, you know, and I found myself going back and when the coworker is like, no man, like everything that you're going through, you know, like just, it was such an investment from every single actor. And I, I again, I think it's a, a great lesson for, for newer or younger actors that like, no matter how you show up in the film, the amount of time you show up because oh. it becomes a really important nugget in the storytelling. So again, kudos to you all. Um, mm. Mustafa, you had something? Yeah, that is so beautifully said. Um, just like Coleman said, giving a space to actors, you actually understand much more about your story as well. You know, mm. like when we did the first few drafts, I said, to Scott and Dennis, I said, let's open this up to the room. You know, let's invite all the actors. Let's see what they think about it. Let's see what how they feel about these people. And uh, you know, the 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 co-worker at Graveyard, Samrat Chakrabarti, he named his own character. He said, mm. I think his name is this. I think he right. wears his shirt this way. Well, there's think, more ownership. Yeah. That, right. Yeah. I, that's one thing I like as a playwright too. I'm like, because that's really exciting to me. That is a real journey, you know, because it's so lonely to sit down and write. To, you can only write to a point. But then once you open it up, you actually realize abundance of story and like everybody has perspective. You're like, you're part of this bigger thing. That feels amazing. Mm. And then once, oh, man, you and look once, like you wanted this. I'm sorry, go ahead. I felt like I was in the church of this because I thought, because as you know, Rod, look, we're, we're all writers on here and I, I know that anything I write, I only write the first 30 or 40 pages and I have some, have some actors read it because, and then I ask questions. Is there anything you need? Is there anything you're searching for? Because, and then it becomes more tailor-made for the actor as well. I love that moment. And it seems like you guys have done this with this film, that moment where it's not yours anymore. It, right. Like you said, Everything you've given as artists, as writers, directors, and I know you, Rada, you, you do the same. You're like, you want to, you will have vision, but you want to empower people to say, this is yours. What do you think? Let's do this thing together. You know what I mean? You have the big picture yeah. of it. But I like when, when we all have a bit more ownership. Yeah. I always compare it to conducting a quartet, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't play that instrument. I can't. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like I may have written the music, but mm. only a tuba player knows how to play that <laughs> that instrument. They know how to hold it. They know how to. And so at some point, I do think filmmaking becomes more of a spiritual process of like trusting that like Beautiful. you've hired the right people. Now you have to kind of step back and allow them to become mm. the instrument. Um, it, it becomes a dance. It becomes a, a balance of like inviting people into something that is still in progress. Like you do still have to kind of be a protective parent of it until it is time to really hand it over. Um, mm -hmm. But would you, you know, this is something I get asked about in terms of audience, you know, and I, I, I can respond later, but I'm curious, do you feel that there's a particular audience? Did you write this? for a particular, create it for a particular audience? Are you asking me as a writer? Yes, Mustafa. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, absolutely, yes. Well, for okay. those who went through this time, I mean, basically it was, yes, my reaction at the beginning, then it was overall our reaction as a team, but we were writing for our time, what we were going through. This is only one interpretation of what's happening now. And whoever, mm -hmm as so, you know, everybody pretty much lost someone in their life, you right. know, in life in general, but also specifically during this uh, time of uncertainties. So ours is only about uh, one person 
but it represents uh, you know a bigger story there so whoever whoever watches this film i think can find something they can relate to some pain they went through. Mm -hmm. It feels to me, the, the thing that I was thinking about earlier today is like, you know, we think about what are we going to talk about on here. I kept thinking, well, you know, somebody asked me, well, what is it about? I said, it feels like a, a love letter to these times, which is a strange thing. Mm. But, it, but it felt like it's, a, it's something that you put into a capsule and say, this is what happened. We were here. We dealt with it this way. But we found some grace and we found some love and we found a new way to move forward. That's what it feels yeah. like. So, in my mind, it feels like a love letter to to New York at this time, in these times. And and I, I just have to say, um, it's it's a healing agent, mm. you know. Like I, you know, you make something and you're surprised by who reaches out and says, "I needed to see that." And so, um, I think, right, right, it's a love letter to our time. It gives people who've had the experience a chance to see themselves and have a cathartic experience. But I feel like it's also something that maybe could be used in the future to talk about, mm. you know, how we survived or mm. if we survived, what survived mm. this epidemic? Because it's, it's like it's like you were saying, uh, Coleman, I think a good portion of us are in denial about this thing. And maybe we're, and there'll be waves of the impact of this thing in who knows maybe a hundred years from now we'll still be dealing with the psychological impact of this thing but i think that the film because it becomes an opportunity like of course it could be like an educational and teaching tool um not just about covid but about the impact on this particular community but just an opportunity for 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 discussions to be had about this thing that you know uh, again, so powerful that we never name it, but we know exactly, we know exactly what it is. And so I think that's a testament to, you know, the skill of the storyteller. So, um, I mean, I think great things are on the horizon. You guys have already won a bunch of awards, but what, what are your hopes for the film? you know, at this particular point, now that it's done, now that it's in the world, what are you hoping um, it will do? I, I, Aside I'll from win yeah. a couple of more awards. Yeah, you know, it, it, besides that, I'll, I'll take lead in and tell you these guys, I feel like I would love, personally love for this film just to be, I, you know, we see, I'm not, listen, Rada, we have our own side conversations about film all yes. day long. We text yes, each other. Yes, we do. And we're DMs. very- Everything. And, we're very about everything. and that's why I love and respect about Rada in particular, because we're very honest with each other about, because at the end of the day, we're just trying to get to figure out how are we doing this thing that we love so much in the film space and what messages and stories are we getting out there? And this is one that I hope resonates as loudly as, you know, the, the films that I feel like there's certain films you feel like need a little push to be, hear these stories, hear this Turkish man, know about somebody who lives in Queens like this who does a frontline worker, who does this, who has a daughter who speaks both language like this, get to know them. Get to know them because I think that what, that's what makes it, us get a little closer to each other um, right. and know that we're all, it's just another slice of life that I want other people to know. Mm. Scott? You no, know, I, 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 I think it's a perfect thing. I think, I think it is a slice of life. And I think it's, you know, instead of reading in a textbook, you can just watch the film. And I think as long as it has the impact that it's had on the people, and people are emotional by watching it because they can relate to it. I think that's the biggest win of them all. Mm -hmm. And like, just a, like a personal story, I guess, um, and maybe a little too personal, but hey, we're talking about the film and what real life's all about. But two weeks ago, my wife was in the hospital and mm -hmm. everything is all good and whatnot. And we were talking to the nurses and we got close to them and we were just talking about film and whatnot. And we I mentioned the film. And the next day, because my wife was there for a couple of nights, the next day, one of the nurses starts walked in. She started crying. I'm like, like, what's going on? She's like, all the nurses just took our lunch break and watched your film. Mm -hmm. And I even know they just went on Google. They went on, they, they searched it up and they found it. And however I spoke about the film, you know, they attached themselves to it to even make them want to watch it. And then they watched it and they felt 
so attached to it. And I said, thank you for mm. doing what we've, what we've been through justice. Mm. Because they were on the front lines. They were the ones who were now the people who, with these people in the last moments of them living. They were, they were with the mother of this movie. Mm. They saw the, they had to think about the other side where Yusuf and Rank were. But they were the ones who were using rank to the mothers who passed away with mm -hmm. no one able to visit the hospital. And they were just going so in depth. And each nurse came to me that day. And I get chills about it right now. And like, that's, that's what the filmmaking is all about. If you're mm -hmm. able to create an authentic environment that can affect people universally, that can make people want to talk about it, that people can feel that they were represented in that film, no matter who you are, no matter where you come from, immigrant here, there, what type of work status, you're a grave digger, you're a nurse. If we are able to encompass all of those people in one film, mm. I think that's what I would want for the film to continue to do as long as it continues to connect with people, COVID, pandemic or not. I think it's still something that people can, you know, a young, a young, a young daughter, a young son and a parent has just passed. It's relatable. Beautiful. Piggyback off, uh, Mustafa, you go first, I'll go after you. I was just going to say, um, it's really well said, Scott. There's a one, uh, my one of my favorite quotes written by Rumi, the poet. Mm. He says, um, not the uh, ones speaking the same language, but the ones, uh, ones sharing the same feeling, understand each other. Mm. I think this is beyond language. This is beyond, it's all about feelings and stories unite us through feelings. Hmm. Now, one of the major reasons why we, you know, was was wasn't really necessarily focused on dialogue. It was focused on action. It sure. was, you know, it could be silent the entire film. You, it didn't have to have subtitles, and you'll still know and feel and go through the same journey the characters were going through. And that's what we wanted to accomplish as well. Goodness. Oh yeah. So no, what I wanted to say was, I think I'm also really proud of this film because. It's going to stand the test of time, um, given what we've been through. Like, no one is ever going to forget this. And my brother's uh, fiance is a nurse. And when she saw the film, similar reaction. She was in tears and she was like, thank you for this. It was, it was so special to me. And, you know, everyone that, that has seen the film that's close to me, and I asked them for their subjective, you know, opinion, they all are so moved by it. And they all, it all reminds them of a time that was tragic, but we found a way to make it positive. But I'm proud and I think that this film will stand the test of time and will be a film that every time you watch it, you'll always think about and you'll always remember, you know, what we went through, what, what humanity went through. Right. And, it becomes a reflection of where we were at yeah. the time. Um, well, I would like to share my hope for uh, the film. Um, I not only hope that the film has a long life, but that the film creates a gateway for you guys to create more work because uh, clearly, you know, you all have a love and investment uh, in humanity in this particular community, um, but in the more intimate and personal story that speak to the bigger issues. And we just, we need you. You know, we need you in the world. Um, I think with all that is going on, you know, filmmaking, storytelling, in my opinion, is, um, you know, a great bastion of, 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 of uh, movement, of healing, of creating change, you know. So I'm hoping that you all continue, you know, what you started with this film and just tell more stories. Um, and focus the lens on, you know, a variety of different communities because it is it is desperately needed, especially now with all the strife that's going on in the country and, you know, um, the jingoism and the stereotypes around certain immigrant groups. You know, film becomes an opportunity to create a mirror to people's humanity. So I pray that you guys, you know, get to create more work in the spirit of this wonderful film. Um, and I think on that note, though, like, we can wrap it up. I Let's wrap so. it up. Let's Brother, wrap Brother, it up. Thank, I, you. thank you to the filmmakers, Scott, Mustafa, um, Dennis, 
Coleman um, for making this really beautiful film, Lelac. And um, if you haven't seen it, you're crazy. You need to click on a link and check it out because it is 16 minutes of beauty. It really is. So congratulations, you guys. Thank, Thank you very much. much.